gotten applause so early in my speech. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Montague Methodist Church for welcoming us so willingly to use both the sanctuary and the fellowship hall where we will be having refreshments afterwards. We do have a birthday cake, yay! Wow. <laughs> and I'd like to thank Jerry Grady for taping and also Kim and Oh, I had left my paper over there, Cotus. Oh, also gosh. for taping and making wonderful memories of this evening. When we do have refreshments, there are two red binders back on one of the center tables, and they have been put together by someone, I know not whom. There's one that has marriages and obituaries, and another one that has the anniversaries that have come out of the Chronicle and the Observer and the Beacon and went to the Forum. So they go back to the 1950s. See if your family's in there. My parents are both in there. And I would like now at this time to introduce Lois Ekstrand, who's going to present the Historical Preservation Awards. Help me welcome Lois. several to the people who uh, have enhanced their property, maintained it, kind of added to the uh, beauty and, and preservation of the White Lake area. And so tonight, sometimes we give many, but tonight we're giving two. And I'd like to introduce the toppings, Jan and John Topping. Would you come up, please? here it's the smaller of the two houses and it's on South Shore Drive and you know it, it used to be that from Montague city limits and Whitehall city limits on toward the lake the big lake uh, it was all summer cottages now it's not that way anymore a lot of people are living here year-round have built bigger and better, as they consider, uh, houses. But some of the charm of the older houses, the smaller houses, uh, kind of being lost. But not the toppings. They haven't lost it. <laughs> <laughs> they fixed up their house and, well, I, I shouldn't say fixed it up because that would mean that they really remodeled it. What they did was maintain it. And so I'd like them to tell you a little bit about it. Okay, I have a couple pictures. I don't know if anybody's interested. But I have a microphone. Call. We can just microphone. Oh, closer. Okay. I have a couple pictures of it so I can pass them around. And you can see what it is like now and what it was like when we bought it. And um, first I'd like to thank Sherry for Amateur Historical Society for choosing our small cottage to receive the plaque for Whitehall. And in the book, in looking aft on page 228, there's a map of White Lake, and it <clears throat> lists the Hague's cottages. And Bob Hague is still in the area. He lives about four doors from us. And our cottage was moved um, from another location, and Mr. Hague's grandfather owned these cottages. And these cottages are all painted very bright orange <laughs> so that new people would know where the cottage was. And we are at 4489, we're probably the smallest one on the lake. And, um, <laughs> and when we bought it, it had small, smaller windows in it, if you can see by any of the pictures. And it was very dark inside because it had brown paneling. So we painted the inside white and then we had new windows put in so that we could see the lake because otherwise you had to stand right in front of the window in order to look out. <laughs> and um, the reason the, they were moved there is they were on the, um, when the highway came through, they were out there and they were on um, Reynolds at that time. So they were moved to our location. And I'm not exactly sure what year that was, but um, 
Bob Haig has much of the information on our cottage yet. So if anybody is interested at all, and Bob still lives there right on South Shore Drive. And um, if there's any more information, you can probably get that from Bill, from um, Bob, if you want any more information. So how long have you owned it? We, owned, we bought it in 89. Uh -huh. And so we've been there almost about 20 years. Every day. No. So, well, it was all, always a uh, um, paint spray, paint spray, so we're still doing that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the plaque, and we hope oh, you'll you. proudly put it on your house. <laughs> well, I really appreciate it. It's um, something right, I think. Look out here. We got to do a real quick <laughs> shot. That's good. I'll take one more and one with flash. That's good. Take one more. Here we go. Cool. All right. You're going to be in the scrapbook, you see. That was what this was okay. all about. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Watch your card. Channel Trail and I have all my life and every time I go to town I pass the Ripley house. Well I passed it when it was a dance studio, I passed, passed it when it was a residence, a play yard, everything. But it kind of fell into, well not disrepair but they just didn't seem to maintain it very well until two very inventive <laughs> and ambitious ladies bought it. And that's Cheryl Smith and Annie Rupert. And they have taken the job of restoring it to a beautiful, beautiful uh, home. And uh, they're going to sell it. So if you know somebody who wants a really nice house, uh -huh. show it to them. Uh, it's here. And there's, there was an open house, so a lot of you got to see it. So, um, where are you, Cheryl and Annie? <laughs> We've already kind of done our spiel when you came to our house, so I don't know if that needs repeating. But what I want to say is I really feel like you were on our team. And what I mean by that is every time you would go by, you'd toot your horns, you'd stop in, I'd see you in the grocery store, you'd ask about it, people would come down with wine, we had historians come by. I really felt like it's the community's house. I really felt that, and you helped us make us feel that way. So thanks. It, you know, it was... It was a labor of love, and you made it enjoyable. Your visits were helpful um, in so many ways. So that's what I would like to let you know. I really appreciate you guys being part of our team. Have you got something to say? No, I put mom in charge of speaking. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you. Well, that's good. Look around right here. Here we go. Big smile. That's good. And take one more here. Okay. We'll take one with flash. There we go. Big smiles. Good. One more so in case you can close your eyes. <laughs> that's going to happen. It's about to happen. That wouldn't happen, would it? Cool. All right. Very good. Thank How long did you work on it? Uh, just short of a year. Uh -huh. So it was, we thought, I thought maybe four or five months, my mom thought oh. maybe five or six, but we were, um, yeah, off. Uh, off. <laughs> <laughs> the porches took three months, so that was a surprise. But, um, yeah, we were, we were six days a week, and um, the, we used the local contractors, and they were fantastic. Yeah. Um, we had one contractor that stayed with us from the beginning to the end, Tim Hahn, and he was a master carpenter. Um, and without him, for sure, we would have the end result that we have right now. So, oh, that's yeah, great. so we that's had the blessing great. of that for sure. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so well, thank, thank you, you for this. Oh, thank well, you here you are. <laughs>
Not only do we have the Historical Preservation Awards tonight, but we have a very special award created for a very special person. And I'm going to ask Roger Sharma, our resident historian, to present it. She said read it. Read it, yes. <laughs> God, I had to learn how to read. Um, this award, basically, years ago, 26 years ago, we started to celebrate White Lake. And uh, I was just kind of recalling what would happen. Like, I, I had a conversation with Tanya Kabbalah, and Tanya said, we ought to do something about White Lake. You know, let's do something, whatever. What can we do? Uh, we have an old wooden boat show, environmental people come in. Uh, and I, I learned from my, my city planning days that somehow, you know, it's kind of the role of the historical side. The more people know about a place, the more they appreciate it, the more they respect it. And, and uh, you're also getting ready for Mr. Bad when he wants to plow it under. And, uh, but anyway, uh, just, um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful occasion. So we decided, okay, let's do Celebrate White Lake. <clears throat> it involved old wooden boats, and uh, everybody loves old wooden boats. And uh, in the bunch of environmental groups, uh, the fish people, uh, I mean, you name it, Dan came and signed books, uh, things like that. So anyway, the award says White Lake Area Historical Society presents this award to Tom Thompson. So Tom, you're going to have to come up here. Uh, <laughs> so celebrate White Lake because basically it was an endless task. And at first we started out with lots of people and as you know the volunteers get slower and slower and they disappear and they don't end up. So Tom did one hell of a job on basically organizing this. So Tom, uh, here we are, Tom Thompson. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One more. Okay, okay. Go. That's good. Okay, big smile. There we go. Cheese. Cheese. We go with the flash recycle. There we go. Cool. There you go. Say right. a word. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to give a little history of this thing. Actually, it's 26. We're pretty sure it is. Yep. About six years ago, we discovered. Can you hear me all right? No. Okay. All right. Okay. About six years ago, I think Roger, we did, we on the posters going through them. We discovered that we had used the same number twice. <laughs> like, you know, a number 20, we had the date the next year, but it's like show number, event number 25 twice or something like that. But I think we, we got it straightened out. This is the, the proper number all the way up. And, you know, this thing just sort of started, I don't know, way back when, and like Roger, it just sort of, sort of rolled along a little bit and we kept it going. And I think the nice part about it was, besides just being a boat show, it had, we produced a poster every year, and that was, a, so this brought the history part into it. And we have these posters, my garage, if there's ever one you want, just give a holler and we can find it for you, and so forth, so we, we have that. Uh, and I, I guess that's about it. Uh, again, just thank you. If you have any questions, you can always catch me afterward. Okay, great. We always kind of turn to Jerry Grady, and Jerry Grady does wonderful poster work, and he was very, very helpful on the posters. Jerry, raise your hand. Also, you know, I was thinking that on the architectural awards, it's a committee, so I see Cassie, Lois. Who's, who's on the committee if they're here? Stand up and just sort of. Okay, it's Ruth Pitkin. Cassie Ellis, Ellie Dennis, Jean Lane, you, and me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good group. Okay, thank you. Where you go? Hang on, Dan. Take another minute to sit. Before I turn it over to Dan, who will present our program for the evening, I'd like to just do a brief summary of what I learned today about the, the historical society and the way it came to be. They observed their charter night on August 10, 1978. That's 40 years ago last month. 
and the current membership at that time was 30 members. Today we have a membership of well over 100, over 120. Whether they all come or not, not so much. <laughs> We're lucky if we get 40 a meeting, which is very sad because we try to have very interesting meetings. But it began as an offshoot of the White Lake Area Bicentennial Commission, and it encompassed the cities of Whitehall and Montague, as well as the townships of Montague, Whitehall, Fruitland, White River, and Blue Lake. So there were seven municipalities involved, and they still are part of our area that we serve. White Lake Area Historical Society began under the leadership of Darwin Bennett, with annual dues of only $5 per person, or $7.50 per family, which is not all that greatly increased to, to today. Today it's, <laughs> it's $10 a member, and I think 15 a family, Tom? Yeah. The original officers included Carol Ackerberg, Marge Conrad, Robert Wilson, and Mika Pearson. One of their purposes was to collect and tape, oral tapes, of local residents as they recollected the memories of the old days, quote and unquote. Another purpose was to put together a compila compilation of all the centennial farms and homes in the White Lake area. They had six listed goals, and I'm going to read them briefly because I found them very interesting. Number one, to support all efforts to restore and preserve significant historical structures and sites. Number two, to initiate an ongoing program to designate historical landmarks in the White Lake area as a valuable educational resource for all future generations. Number three, to support the preservation of remaining significant natural areas that have not yet been developed by man. Number four, to promote our area as a tourist attraction and national landmark in Michigan's colorful lumbering era, which we will learn more about tonight. Number five, to support all efforts to retain significant older structures and homes that are salvageable. We have fallen short on some of those efforts in our area, sad to say. And number six, to support in principle all efforts already made by the Montague Museum and other area historical groups. And at this time, I would like to turn our meeting over to our own and my favorite presenter, Dan Yakes, as he brings to us life in the Piney Woods. Would you please help me welcome Dan? We did some changes here in the sanctuary. I was not in favor of them, but we used to have a sounding board behind me for people who could stand up front and project, but the powers that be decided that wasn't a good idea any longer. So they took it out and took the lights with them, so um, we'll get lights eventually. It's a little bit dark in here. Another thing, um, I have with me my partner in crime, Steve, Dr. Steve Demos. He's seated over here distinguished character. We uh, have so often some of them are about Muskegon, some are about the county, some are about White Lake. Uh, we have some of them for sale today, including uh, the next edition of uh, Logging White. It just came off the press today. I went down and picked it up. So we'll be back there if anybody wants to buy a copy of that. Uh, we'll be signing if, if uh, how's your hand? Right. I can do it. All right. Uh, I'm splitting the cost. Uh, the the uh, whatever you contribute fit is twenty dollars. Uh, Ten of it will go to the hysterical society. <laughs> so, <laughs> you said hysterical. <laughs> you, you said you've been celibate That's for correct. forty years. <laughs> that is correct. Yeah. Right. I don't go for girls like that. But I changed my mind. You're not my favorite after all. <laughs> well, I, I just must. must Misunderstood. My hearing ain't so good no more. So, uh, you should have gotten a packet like this when you came in. I had thought about using a screen, but we don't really have a screen. So, this is the number two choice. And you may take these with you when you leave. You don't need to put them someplace. If you don't want them, you can shut them aside. But uh, they're, they're yours to have. 
many of these items are in the book. So let's start with uh, the first item you have. The logging around here began in the 1830s. You all heard of the story about Charles Mears and his little brother Albert and two other people coming here to survey the territory, found, uh, wound up establishing a mill site at the mill pond. It's in Whitehall. The pond is still there. It's a different dam. It had two or three dams. But the, the, uh, it was a water power mill and very small scale. And that was how they logged around here originally. Logging and sawing were the same thing. They would saw in the summer. They would log in the winter all around the mill pond. I live right across from the mill pond, so they must have logged off my land. So, and they were probably using oxen or horses, but uh, very small scale. Now we often hear these stories about the loggers coming into Michigan, and of course the old saw was, when I was in college we used to learn that everything north of Grand, uh, a line from Grand Haven to Port Huron was white pine lumber, if not for a couple of cypress trees or something like that, maybe a red pine or two, but uh, a bunch of biologists got together some years ago and put together this book, I'll show it to you. It looks like this. They went back to the original survey maps, which all recorded everything that was on a section that they surveyed, including the forestation. This was important to settlers. Settlers were looking for uh, hardwood trees because they grew on the best soil, and uh, they would avoid sandy soil, swampy soil, and uh, not want to buy that. But lumbermen would, or loggers would, the city, the, the, the state uh, uh, institutions bought those lands because they were often valuable lands for pine uh, growths. They set aside every uh, one section in every um, township, as you know, for school development. So that was never for sale right away. So, but uh, these maps are very interesting. If you take a look at them uh, around this area, there, there are pine groves in this vicinity, but they're scattered. On the south side of the lake, they're mostly hardwoods. And on the north side, it's a lot of uh, hardwoods and some hemlock, and, but not a lot of pine. Now you go east and you get all kinds of pine. You're welcome to look at this, but those are going to dictate where a logger would buy the land. No point in buying land that ain't got no pine on it. All right, so, and then farmers would want to know that too for the opposite reason. Now the, the other mills built here, if you look at that first map, you'll see the, uh, there are some other mills identified. The, the oldest mill is the one at, at uh, the mill pond. The next one was another Mears um, mill at Duck Lake. I'm going to sit down and I'll sit down for a while. I'm tired. <laughs> so then there were three other mills uh, established up the river. Uh, the Dalton brothers, not the bank robbers, but uh, some lumbermen uh, built a mill at Silver. Creek, and then um, a man named Hulbert built one at what became uh, Carlson Creek. Those are not on the map. And then um, the Brown built a, a pond uh, called Brown's Pond, today Rochdale Pond sometimes, and th that was the fifth. And in all cases, they combined this lumbering with logging, and they had the same group of men. They would work in the summer in the mill, and they'd work in the winter, clearing away all the pine. So that was how it all started. Then as you take a look at the map a little bit more, you'll find that in the 50s, some steam power mills came in. The first of them was the uh, Ferry Mill, F-E-R-R-Y, Ferry. Now uh, that's a family from Grand Haven. William Montague Ferry a Senior was a minister, Presbyterian, and uh, had three sons and a daughter. And uh, of course, our Ferry Memorial Church is named for Noah, who ran the mill at the mouth. He went on to the Civil War and died at Battle of Gettysburg, as you probably all know. So he started the mill there, the steam powered mill, and uh, it's on the east side of the channel, the old channel, and they did uh, 
pretty good business there. That uh, mill eventually was sold to a family named Jewel, uh, and they moved it up to Maple Grove, you know, where the Montague bathing beach is. And then some other loggers came in as well. M Montague and Whitehall are kind of unusual um, compared to the bigger lumber um, towns in Michigan, like Saginaw Bay City and Muskegon. Those mills usually were operated by partnerships consisting of some rich dude from Maine or New York or uh, somewhere else, and then some local partners. And the local partners did the actual work in the mill, and the, the rich guy from the east usually gave orders and collected um, profits and that sort of thing. And so many of the, the mills in those places were founded by wealthy men from Maine and Massachusetts. And we do have a few of those, those around here. For example, the um, um, Wilcox Mill, uh, Wilcox, uh, Sextus Wilcox had a big family. They had a mill also in uh, Muskegon, and they had uh, their origins in the east. And then you have the Heels, they're from Maine, Heel family. He's the first man to um, uh, log up the White River back in the 1850s. And you have a few others that, uh, that are outsiders. But most of our local mills were started and mainly run by local people. I would put the ferry Dowling in there as well because the ferries were, were from Grand Haven and not that far away. They eventually, one of the members of the family moved to Chicago. And uh, of course you've got the Coval, Staples Coval Mill. That's a local operation. And uh, many of our mills were small scale and um, they didn't have big partnerships. The reason they have these partnerships is uh, by the 1870s, uh, corporations had entered the picture, and uh, they were mostly banks and railroads, those who, that's who ran the corporations, and everybody hated the railroads. And if they didn't hate the railroads, they hated the bank. Who foreclosed on your loan? The bank. Who robbed you when you tried to send your goods to market? Because there's only one railroad, and you got to pay their rate, whatever it is. You remember those old movies about the beautiful maiden who's, uh, uh, who, who, whose mother has been uh, uh, evicted by who? The bank. But of course, we can fix that up. Uh, old Simon the Greedy can forget about that debt if little Lucy will go to bed with him. And of course, she refuses. So what does he do? He ties her to the railroad track and ties her to the rails. This makes all kinds of sense, you know. So, <laughs> is that going to make any difference? No. Oh, and then finally, uh, Sergeant Preston or somebody comes along and saves her at the last minute before the uh, locomotive comes along. So, uh, there's not a lot of love for corporations. So, these lumbermen do not form corporations. Another problem with corporations, because of the banks and the railroads, they had to fill out all these uh, forms every year. They, they, had, they were subject to government regulations. So they formed partnerships. And that means usually two, three, four partners. Sometimes you have a silent partner. And they, of course, uh, uh, pool their resources. But the problem with a partnership is if you've got a partnership with a crook, he's allowed to run off with the uh, sweetheart secretary and leave you holding the bag as the other partner. So they, uh, many of them around here were made up of uh, relatives, like brothers and brothers-in-law and so forth. So it's a little harder to uh, find a rotten, uh, rotten apple in the, in the bushel that way. So, but, but partnerships were a troublesome thing, but they don't have to form, they don't have to fill up papers. They don't have to report to the government every year. That was another advantage of that. Well, let's get away from the, uh, the uh, about, there is a little bit about that. Let's look in our folder. And you'll find uh, the second sheet is a list of all the lumber yards and uh, sawmills and uh, logging companies. Now I got these from a variety of sources, um, mostly from the log marking books. They're all listed in there. If they had a log mark, they're in Lansing at the state archives. And I got them from uh, county records. They're also over in Lansing. Uh, they, they did have to file paperwork with the uh, state, Secretary of State, 
and uh, or some other undesirable location for that time. And they're desirable places now. I went to school in Kansas, so I better not say that. Anymore. But uh, at any rate, uh, uh, the, the better, more desirable properties were already gone. So you ideally want something on the river or a tributary of the river. You want uh, lots of pine trees. You want to have uh, access, ideally a high bank so you can load your logs onto the river, into the river. You wanted to have uh, um, access in, into the interior as much as possible. So most of the land that they identified uh, was either Oceana County, New Wega County on the north side and on the south side parts of Muskegon and parts of uh, New Wega as well. As a result, many of the log marks they developed work just as well on the White River as they work on the Muskegon or on the uh, Pear Marquette if you go north. Because these camps were often in between the two river systems and so they were set up so that a log could be sent down either river system, depending on how close it was to the point of, of a felon. So they're going to get their land, uh, some of them, from the Homestead Act, but mostly they get them from preemption claims. Federal law allowed that whoever was uh, uh, holding a piece of property up to 160 acres could buy it at the minimum price, dollar, quarter, an acre, uh, when the surveyors came through. If you were sitting on that property and uh, had a, built some kind of a structure, uh, and then you could buy it. Didn't, you wouldn't have to go to an auction. Now, if, if you were not sitting on it, the land would go to an auction. And uh, then you might have to pay more, depending upon whether someone was bidding against you. You might have to pay a, a bunch more. Now, on the other hand, there were lands that had been set aside for the state of Michigan, salt lands, swamp lands, school section lands, and those lands could be bought, possibly, from the state if the state wanted to. Now, they didn't sell the, the, uh, gov the uh, school lands until the 1870s. The state was smart back then. They held on to the land until it was worth more, and then they would sell it if there was still pine on it. Some of these lands had lost their pines by that time, even though the uh, owner didn't, or even though the government didn't know they were gone necessarily. But most of them were still good land by the 1870s and brought a big price. On the other hand, you could um, buy land from uh, men uh, who had served in, in a war. In 1812 and the uh, Mexican War, the uh, people who had worked, uh, who had served in the war, uh, got uh, uh, called a lumber scrip or timber scrip. Uh, they were pieces of paper, gave you title to 160 acres of land, you could pick it up yourself. But of course, many of these men lived in Massachusetts or Rhode Island or someplace like that, had no intention of coming to Michigan, but they would sell their land to somebody else. Uh, maybe 50 cents an acre, a dollar, and something, make a profit, and th they were never going to use the land anyway, but it was a way of getting some money for themselves. So sometimes these lands went very cheaply to anybody who wanted to put up the money. You usually had to have cash. So um, some of this land comes into private use well before the 1850s, and uh, they didn't have any plan on developing it, but they were holding it uh, for somebody who would eventually pay for it. Now, when they started, logging. Uh, if you take a look at the next sheet, uh, there are two kinds of logging that are done around here. One is called main style logging, and there's a picture of a main style uh, chopper, and it's a nice engraving. Uh, it looks like, uh, so they're sawing, I'm sorry. It looks like that. I have a poor picture. I took one for myself. It looks like that, all right? This is an old engraving. If you have a good copy, uh, you can take a look at how they did these. This is from Harper's Weekly. Leslie's Weekly did the same thing. They came up every week. They had no photographic ability uh, for print, but they had lithographic ability. So every week they would get images they wanted to display. And they would cut up the image into pieces and give each piece to a different engraver. Because they have to engrave on, 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 a, on another substance and then turn it around and print with that See. And in order to get something out inside of a week, you had to have multiple artists working on the same project. So you can see, uh, look for squares, and you'll see there's little imperfections where the edge of one engraver's work uh, interrupts uh, somebody else's work. It's especially good on these big pictures that, that we have here. Well, main style logging uh, usually operated on a real small scale, but that was how it was. 
Uh, you didn't have a lot of money. You had time. You had energy. Uh, youth, but you didn't have money. So a crew would only be eight to ten men. You'd have a cook. Every camp had to have a cook. And the better the cook, the better. You had a crappy cook. You did not have happy campers. And they probably would leave rather than stick around because they can go someplace else. And then you'd have a foreman, and you'd have probably a blacksmith, because they have oxen and sometimes horses that had to be cared for. And then uh, you'd have uh, a couple of sawyers and a couple of swampers and uh, some people who loaded the um, sledges. And then you uh, had maybe one uh, teamster. So you had eight to ten. Some people did more than one job. You might have to have a, um, a um, uh, a filer, someone who filed the saws every day, and filed the, uh, the axes and kept them sharp. So that's about the end of the crew. They worked with uh, oxen usually, they're docile animals. Uh, they worked pretty well. Some of them became very famous. Uh, there's Dave, the so-called blue ox, and his, uh, a couple of his cousins and so forth. So um, they were um, uh, oxen were, were often used in these early main style operations. Uh, the, the way they would log is this way. They would uh, go into the woods and uh, the uh, foreman, who was the chopper, he would literally chop down the trees. That's how Paul Bunyan became famous. He had the biggest axe in the world. He would whirl it around. He, he didn't use a handle. He just put it on a lasso and he would just swing it around and he cleared everything within the circum circumference of his swing. He just wanted to blow and then take care of it and then he could go rest someplace else. So uh, the, you had the feller and he chops down the whole tree. I mean, there's no sawing here. He just hacks it here, hacks it there, and hopes it falls in the right direction. Then you have a couple of, of men called swampers and they will use a saw to cut it into sections, depending on what the order is. The usual was 12, uh, 10, uh, 12, 14, and 16 footers, but they might have a request for something smaller, or they might have telegraph poles 20 feet long or something like that. But uh, those were the standard, 12, 14, and 16, uh, two foot increments. And they'd usually cut it a little longer than that in case there was any damage or something happened to one or the other end. And then the ox would drag it directly down to the um, mill pond or to the river. Um, and uh, oh, of course, now the, uh, I left out a step. You have a couple of uh, other men who cut off the twigs and the branches, if there were any. But uh, uh, that, that you would have then these other two men who would load it onto the sledge. Uh, they, they had different ways of moving those big logs. Sometimes they would use an old-fashioned uh, um, sled. Uh, just hook it onto the back. This is a sled for human conveyance. They just put it up on top of the back of the sled. They just track it on off to uh, the uh, the uh, river or, or the mill pond. Or uh, later on, they developed what the, the Swedes called these go devils. You ever heard of a go devil? Well, it's basically the crotch of a tree, a hardwood tree. It's a Y shape. And so they hook up the long portion, the stem of the Y, up to an oxen, and they put the log on the Y end, the V-shaped end, and they haul it off that way, they chain it up and haul it off. So that's pretty good for short distances, and it didn't uh, do a whole lot of harm. Uh, and, and that's really all the men you needed to, that, to do that kind of a job. They'd get it down to the um, uh, mill pond, or in, in this case, river, and if it was going to go on the river, then they'd have to mark it with a log line. We'll talk about that later on. Because your logs are going to get intermixed with all the other loggers on that river, and you have to have a way of identifying yours versus theirs, otherwise you're going to get cheated and robbed of, of your hard work. Uh, now the actual camp in a main style camp consisted of really just two buildings. You had a combination dining hall, bunk house, kitchen that was very low slung, usually made of logs, one level high, real shallow roof. There's a picture of one of them in here. Um, well, this is a picture, of course, of the oxen uh, trekking 
Uh, they're using, uh, that's a go devil. Well, I mean, it's a, a sledge, I should say, that, that's uh, hauling it out. And then we have the picture of the camp. Uh, this one here is another Harper's Weekly. It's a beautiful picture. And then here's the inside of the, uh, of that hut. That's upside down. Well, you have copies. Uh, now, this shows the interior of that uh, small place. You notice they have a big, uh, they call that a camp boost in the middle. Uh, the railroaders took over that word, they called it a caboose, but the original name was the camp boost, which is in other words, uh, in this case, a stove, a fireplace, and then they have an actual chimney. Some of these my main camps didn't even have a chimney. They just put it under a center bowl and the smoke's supposed to get up, uh, rising up. Now you see, uh, they have a deacon's bench here. Uh, we have a deacon's bench here in the church. Uh, there's those six chairs around the camp booths out in the, uh, in the hall there, you see. I sit there most mornings and share my wisdom with Jack Lipka and Bob uh, Hubbard, a bunch of the other people younger than me, and uh, I sometimes learn something from them, even young as they are. So uh, it's sort of the same thing. This is where you go to do your uh, fiddle playing, uh, accordion playing, uh, telling the stories. It's called a deacon's bench because the only people allowed in there are deacons like me, Deacon Dan. And that means we always tell the truth. So I thought, uh, I don't do any dancing, I don't do any court playing, but I do have a story to tell. Um, I do sing a little bit. Uh, I got a song for first. I'm a lumberjack, I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work all day. Smell pretty bad, but I don't care. Cause I got no sleep, I got no fleas in my underwear. Okay, I got the words right. I'm no, sorry about that. Tell you the story. This was about uh, Paul Bunyan. And you know he had this great big ox. The, all the different stories vary. Some say he was only 12 feet, 14 inches tall. Some say he was uh, 20 feet tall. Babe was 20 feet tall or 12 feet tall or whatever. Sometimes his horns were so far apart that a bird got lost flying from the tip of one to the tip of the other. Can't make any sense out of none of that. So, but this story is about Paul Bunyan. And um, Ox, oh, he was a young man then. And Babe was just learning how to do things. And uh, they, they got the free, he was foreman of a camp out in the woods, up where in Nuevo there somewhere, and uh, he noticed that the, the roads was all crooked. They didn't just twist them all over the place, and he, he was paying these men a lot of money, and the, the quicker they could get those logs down to the river, the better, and wouldn't it be better if they had a straight road? Because these things twisted around there. One was alphabet soup road. Every letter in the alphabet was written out there, in this road and it's twisted all over the place. So they took Bay with them and some equipment, some chains and such, and they went out to the end of the road. And it took them 30 miles to get there. Now, of course, they were big, so they had big steps. And uh, it didn't take them but a couple of hours to get there. I was riding on, on Bay, so I couldn't have gotten there in a the day. But they got there in about two hours. And they came to the end of the road after all these twists and turns. And so, um, uh, uh, Paul had this great big set of tongs and he attached the end of that rope to the biggest tree he could find. It was a five foot diameter rope uh, tree and he hitched uh, the rope to that tree. And then they come on back through the twisted and came to the end back to camp. And that was 30 miles and he, uh, he hitched Babe up to the other end of that rope. And they pulled and hauled, took them a couple hours. But they finally straightened out that rope. It took a 30-mile road and turned it into a 14-mile road, and wasn't that wonderful. But the problem was, what are they going to do with those other 16 miles of road? Well, it turns out Montague was just getting started right then, and Montague needed some roads. But uh, so Paul took and he put some staples into the end of that road, some pegs down there so they didn't fall loose, and he cut off the rest of it. But as soon as he cut it off, it got all crinkled up again, all turned around. And turned. So they sold it to Montague, and they used it to build Old Channel Train. <laughs> and that's how it happened. Now, I got other stories about Babe the Blue Ox. Babe was never blue, except that one year in the winter of the bad storm, 76. 
He was white, born white and always white. And uh, the problem was, in that big storm, back in 1876, they was working. I mean, you didn't get paid if you didn't work. So everybody had to work, even in a snowstorm. And they was hauling logs with the bay, but they was big, but he was a long way from Paul. He, Paul was at the back, and Dave was at the front, and he got so you couldn't see him. The snow was coming down so bad. So that night, he took him into the barn, and they had some leftover paint they'd been using for ceilings and such, and they painted them blue. And that way you could see him through the snow. I mean, that made a lot of sense, didn't it? Now, Dave didn't like that at all, but uh, uh, he, he was a, a good-natured ox, so uh, that worked for the rest of the year. But in the spring, uh, he wanted to get all, rid of all this paint, so Paul took him out to a lake east of town here and washed him off. And of course, uh, turned the lake blue. I guess they have a fine arts camp out there now, don't they? That's what I heard. I don't know. Anyway, that's uh, how they became blue. I got Big Harden. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Never heard of them, folks. Uh, I got one more. The, the, the hoop snake. I'm sorry, the hoop snake. Well, Paul left. He went out to Wisconsin, finally in Oregon. He must have lived 842 years because you keep hearing all these stories about Oregon, Tahiti, and Alaska. And Alaska. But we know it all came from Michigan. Uh, so, but he finally left. He got tuckered out. And, and he wouldn't take me with him. Uh, I was getting a little old, I guess. So uh, he, uh, I had to stay, and I got a job on the railroad. And uh, as I was working on the railroad, it, it was building this road from uh, Montague up to uh, uh, Park. They called it the Chicago and West Michigan back then, 1871. I remember it well. And we was working away just on the right of way there. I, I had my, uh, my camp hook with me. Uh, this I can't hook. If I had a, I'm going to put this away. This is a can't hook. It's not called because you can't hook. You, uh, this is the can't, and this is the hook. See, this is a, so. This is what you do to to move logs around, uh, and that's what I was doing on this railroad site. I was trying to get these logs out of the way. Well, along come, I saw all, all the folks working with me. I saw them running away. And I said, what are you running for? The hoop snake's coming. The hoop snake. Well, I looked down and never seen one before. This hoop, this hoop snake was coming down the right away from Whitehall, just coming across the bridge. And this is the funniest looking thing you ever saw. This gigantic snake, he, he, he had hooked onto his tail with his fangs, and he was rolling along. You know, they, they're pretty slow when they're out there in the woods, but he had figured out a way to go fast. So I hooked onto his tail, and he was rolling along like a hook at him, and everybody was running. I'd never seen such a thing in my life. So I just stood there, petrified, with my camp hook out in front of me, and dang if that snake did not hook from its tail and, and try to bite me. He had hooks the size of elephant tusks. They was gigantic. He's all a poisonous snake, too. But he bit into my can hook handle. This is a new handle, as you can see, uh, because the old one got uh, destroyed. Well, he kept on, he, once he saw he couldn't get at me, he kept rolling on, probably wound up in Ludington or someplace. I don't know, I don't care, they can keep him. But um, what happened was my, my, my handle for my, my uh, can hook got all swelled up, you know, because all that poison went into that hickory. And it, it just started swelling up, just like if you got bit by a snake. It all swell up. Well, the same thing happens to the wood. Well, it got some, so it knocked off the cant, and it kept getting bigger and bigger. Well, as it turns out, it was right next to the Ferry Dowling Mill. So I dragged that, and by that time, a log, dragged it over to the mill, and we cut off the last 16 feet of it. It had grown that big. And, uh, as soon as I cut that and cut that off, another 16 inch, another 16 feet showed up, and we kept cutting and moving and cutting and moving. Before you know it, we had enough wood for 75,000 rail ties. The railroad didn't have to spend a penny on rail ties, and we built that whole railroad on up to mirrors uh, with nothing but the rail ties from that from that uh, uh, 
and can't hook handle. Well, that worked out real good for many years. And then finally, the Chicago and West Michigan sold out to the Paramar Cap. And that was uh, almost all over the state. But they were a cheap bunch of bums. They, 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 they put most of their money in, into Detroit, and Flint, and places like that. And everything left over, they put over here in western Michigan. They had the most rotten box cars. It was a terrible operation. They uh, didn't put no money into it at all. And their box cars was all rotten. The floors were gone. Well, by that time, we was uh, uh, producing fruit around here, a lot of fruit trees. We had plums, and we had peaches, and apples. And, and uh, they got a load of uh, prunes. And these prunes was going to go up to the uh, tannery up in New Era. But they put them in these old rotten box cars. And, you know, uh, and they, they just started moving. But then a rainstorm came along, and it rotted out the bottoms. And all those prunes fell along the right away, all the way from here to Mears. And as soon as those prunes got into those uh, ties, they started shriveling up. You know prunes, they just draw the poison on it. And they drew the poison on all those ties, and before you know it, they was no bigger than toothpicks. So how are you going to run a railroad that way so the company had to put out a lot of money? Well, it turned out all right, because those uh, prunes swelled up to be the size of boulders, three, four inches, of, three or four feet in diameter. So the company sold them to a fellow out in Arizona, and he built Boulder Dam from them. Oh. Oh. Oh, my you don't like that? Oh. I added a little to that one. All right, well, I'm, I might have another story or two later. But um, let's get back to the other kind of logging. We had uh, uh, Maine-style logging, but most of our uh, operations here in, in Michigan were large scale, including uh, most of the White Lake area. Now this means you have a big crew of 50, 60, maybe 100, 120 workers and all kinds of specialization. So you have a, uh, you probably have an Inkslinger. Uh, you remember Johnny Inkslinger was uh, Paul Bunyan's uh, counting and tally man. And they have a scaler and they'll have a, uh, a saw filer and they'll have an axe grinder and a, all kinds of specialty. A cook and probably a lot of helpers. And you're going to feed 120 men you're going to need a lot of helpers. So uh, the crews got much bigger. And each, uh, in each camp, you'd have a different crew assigned to a different part of the property. So the, the, the roads would fan out from the main roadway, and you'd uh, go out every morning, and uh, uh, each crew would do its own business. Now, once they got to the uh, pines, uh, usually the foreman of that section would uh, be the, um, they called him the feller, F-E-L-L-E-R. He, his job was only to notch the trees, to undercut the trees. So he takes his big um, axe, looks like this. This is a Michigan axe. How do I know it's a Michigan axe? Because it's Michigan. Now the, the difference, there are different kinds of axes. Most axes are curved here at the top, just as they are at the bottom. But a Michigan axe is straight across. And that's what makes it a Michigan axe. And they're sharp at both ends. So he takes his axe, and he makes the notch, maybe five, six inches deep, in the direction he wants the tree to fall. And it usually does fall that way. And then come along a couple of, um, they're called Sawyers sometimes, they're called uh, other different names, and they saw it on the tree from the opposite side. And I think there's an image in there of both a feller who has just finished notching the far side, and there's two men who are sawing it down. Now, the, the saws themselves are kind of interesting. Um, they're different kinds. Uh, they started out using cross-cut saws that had nothing but teeth in them, figuring the more teeth, the quicker it would go. But of course, it doesn't work that way because they've got this big tall tree and they're slicing a very tiny slice through it with a small kerf and it gets all stopped up with sawdust. So you have to have gaps between the cutting teeth. They're called raker teeth. And they're little tiny ones and they, they form an opening there so that you can scoop out the sawdust. Different kinds, 
The one I have up here, which I'm not going to get up to show you, is a, a no-name type. It's got a tooth, a raker, a tooth, a raker. It's that way across the whole uh, surface. There was another kind called a tuttle, I suppose named for whoever invented it. Got two teeth, a raker, two teeth, a raker, and so forth. There's another kind that has three teeth, raker, three teeth, a raker, and so forth. All the way up to five teeth, uh, depending on which ones you think best. But they still got bound up, so if a saw got bound up inside the tree, there wasn't any way to get it out because they had soldered on handles. And um, you would try to get it going again by pounding wedges, metal iron wedges into the cut to get it to raised up a little bit, but that didn't work with a really big tree. So somebody in Michigan invented the uh, detachable handle. This saw up here, which I'm not going to show you, has detachable handles. You just unscrew them and then you get them off one end and you can pull it right out, clean it up and slick it back in again, attach the handle and you're set to go again. So uh, all of these things happen with uh, loggers. These are things invented by the men themselves, not the superintendent, not the big boss. They, they're sitting in their office doing nothing. But, well, they did a lot, but they didn't do anything with logging. It's the loggers, the people who actually did the work who come up with all these wonderful inventions and then they have to sell them to the owner of the company. That happened quite a lot. So there you've got several crewmen there, and then the next step, once you cut down the tree, you've got to saw it into sections, 16 footers or 14 footers or whatever they are, and then those are uh, sent over to the uh, loading point deep in the woods now, and uh, with the cant hooks, or if they're really big logs, you might use an ox or a horse or something for that. And then uh, you pile them up there, and then you bring in the sledges. These are heavy-duty logging sledges. They can carry many, many logs, and you load them up uh, using uh, the cross hall. Now, there's an image in there of the cross hall. You basically take two smaller trees, and you lop off the bark, and you make them fairly um, clean. And then you can roll the logs up, or if they're small, or use oxen or horses to drag them up from the opposite side, and there's a picture in there of a great huge brag load of logs being loaded with a horde, a couple of horses. I, it's well in there, I'll, I'll have to get it for you. It looks, it's called almost a sled load. Uh, these, these big loads like that were never practical. Those horses would be tuckered out, all of that load any distance. But uh, th this is for photographic purposes, bragging. They're called brag loads. They did a lot of these in preparation for the uh, centennial of 1893, uh, all of the, because there was apparently a competition, but they did it just for fun. And it took a lot of talent to balance that many. I mean, you, you put on the lower level, you chain it up. You put on the next layer, you chain it up. These have to fit pretty well together in order to be stable as you haul them down to the river. So uh, this is a big load, and you see the horses on the far side there, and it takes usually three or four men to handle this big a load. All right, so that's how they, and then they take it down to the, uh, to the river, and there the scaler is going to tell you what it's worth. But uh, the companies wanted to avoid laziness and slobber, slovenly work, so they put each crew in competition with each other crew. They had three or four crews. The crews, interestingly, were all named for their horses. Bob and Becky. And Bob and Becky. No, I'm in Bob and Becky's crew. Because right. well, they always had the same set of horses. But the members of the crew might vary a little bit from day to day. And every week they would have a competition. Whichever crew brought in the biggest uh, pile of logs, based on their um, log feed uh, measurements, a log, a, log, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a lumberman's foot, uh, a, 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 the foot of a, the, the uh, measurement is in terms of board feet. And uh, that's one inch, and that's a real one inch, not the little puny size we have today. One inch uh, by 12 inches wide by 12 inches long. That's a board foot. And the scaler determines how many board feet are in a log, and then that crew will get credit for that many board feet during a month, during a week, or during a month, 
and they, they win uh, benefits at the company store at the end of the week. Uh, there's always a company store in a uh, logging company like this, and you could buy cigarettes or tobacco or whatever was for sale at high prices, of course, but, but uh, it was a benefit that you wouldn't ordinarily get. I shouldn't have said cigarettes. These loggers do not smoke cigarettes. I don't know who this dude is, but the cigarette is that Roger gave us. They're, they smoke pipes, they smoke cigars if they could get them, they chew tobacco, mostly tobacco. They didn't use any pimp sticks, that's what they were called. A pimp stick, you know who, who smokes them. So no good logger would be smoking any pimp stick. I can tell you that right now, I don't know where that guy came from. So, that's how they keep these uh, crews in competition with one another. And um, getting to the scaler, every camp had a scaler, and his job was to measure the amount of board feet in every load. So of course, he can step off the length of the log uh, with his feet, or might use a measure. So he knows it's 16 feet long. Then he always measures the skinny end. Because, of course, these trees grow, they're bigger at the base and they're smaller as you go up. So he's only going to measure the, the small end, and then he'll use this. The loggers call this a swindle stick or a cheat stick. And he take the measurement across, and then there are all kinds of enumerations on here that tell him how many board feet. In other words, you're taking the diameter and uh, multiplying it against the length and coming up with a number for that tree. So a good tree would get you a thousand board feet. An even bigger tree would get you maybe two thousand board feet. So it's a, these are big numbers when they finally got through. And then he'll stamp it with a, with a marker. Now at the end of this uh, bunch of, of items you have, you will see a bunch of the log marks that we have for the White Lake area. Uh, this is a logging hammer. It's very similar to the Goodrich mark that's in, uh, included in those 200 um, log marks that are at the, the end of your packet. I have another one that's similar to a Green and Kelsey log mark. These are not from around here, but I buy them on the, e on, uh, the internet and I try to get marks that are similar to the ones we had around here. This is the more typical type you had around here, with a G. Now, what's the purpose of having a log mark? Well, just for the White Lake area, we have over 200 log marks. And uh, they weren't all in use at the same time. But you still had to mark them because some of those logs are going to get lost, uh, sometimes deliberately, sometimes by accident as they go from the um, grounds where they were produced uh, down to the mouth, down to the river, down the river to the lake, to the mills that were at the head of the lake and down beyond there further too. So each mill had its own set of marks and uh, that's the only way you had of getting them to the proper mill. Now these marks often came from different loggers. A uh, sawmill owner would maybe contract with a given farmer or a logger and he would produce logs with a particular mark on it and then they would get into the river and they'd come on down. Now sometimes you'll see marks that are numbers. There'll be a three or a four. That usually refers to the scaler because some of these companies were run by men who didn't trust their scalers. So they wanted to know who scaled that log. If it turned out to be poorly marked, or if it was um, uh, under, if he measured it incorrectly, making it worth less than should have been, um, or more, then he wanted to know that. And he also wanted to know who struck the mark. Some of these marks are kind of complicated, and they can get confused with other marks. So uh, you wanted to have a good, solid mark. You want to have every part of the log identify every part of the stamp identified so it can be seen. You, you marked it four or five times around 
the edge of the log because it's going to be floating in the river and you want some piece of it to be above water so that the sorters can figure out who it belongs to, you see. So uh, it's got to take great care of this. Now, of course, as they get into the river, uh, there are all kinds of shenanigans that could happen. Uh, they you could lose a log because it got grounded up on the side of the river and not found it for many years. It could get stuck in the mud. The rivers were deeper then than they are today and somewhat wider and swifter. The rivers aren't flushed out as much as they used to be because of all the dams. But every spring in the olden days, they would be, you'd have a spring flush that would flush everything out of there, including last year's logs that didn't get counted and all kinds of other things. So a lot of people, maybe you remember there used to be a sawmill on Spring, uh, spring uh, uh, Creek um, just east of town, Ferenbach. The only, the only logs he ever saw were deadheads logs that he picked up along the river that had been stranded from 30, 40, 50 years earlier. Hmm. There were a lot of companies like that. And eventually he ran through them and he couldn't find any. So he went out of business. But the, uh, the logging marks are very, very important. Uh, these logging marks are registered. By law, they had to be registered in every county through which that river flowed. So in our case, it would be Nuego, Oceana, and Muskegon for the most part. But uh, those same log marks were used in some cases in Muskegon, but not all. So the, the, you have to make sure that they're registered for both rivers if you own that particular mark. And so they're, uh, they're, they're going to go down the river and eventually they'll come to the sorting grounds, the booming grounds. You can still see remnants of the booming grounds to the east, well, north and east of the uh, bridge. That's where the booming ground was. And they'd come in and you'd have the initial sorter, he sorts between Whitehall and Montague. So the marks that, and he's got this in his head. He got a, 200 different marks in his head, you know, this button, this log goes over here, this one goes over there. Then you got another sorter who says, well, this one goes into that pen, and that one goes into this pen. And every company had its own set of pens. And so they put the logs that go to a particular pen into a particular, into a raft, and then eventually they, they get towed. Uh, down to the proper mill. Uh, they, they, they charge rates for this, as the white, the, the booming company charged rates. If you had a mill that was right close to the head of the lake, you didn't get much of a bill. If you were at the governor's mill way down, that'd be where Lakeside is today, you got a bigger bill because they have to haul it further. So that's how they got to the mark. I'm not going to talk about lumbering, but uh, get back to the Michigan camps. Now these were big camps. So they're a bit different from the main camps. Uh, they had separate buildings for the horses. Uh, and uh, the men were in the bunkhouse. And they have a separate building for the dining hall. And probably had a separate building for the kitchen or maybe attached to the dining hall. So they're much bigger. Um, they, all, they still had the camp booths, but it's much uh, bigger. And of course, uh, they, the bunks were, uh, they called them breech style bunks. In other words, you got in through the side. In the main camps, you, they were called muzzle loaders. You got in from the bottom, and you crawled into the top. And that meant you, your feet were always to the fire, you see, because it, it gets cold. But these um, Michigan camps were better insulated and didn't need so much warmth. You always wanted the upper bunk, because uh, they get restless, their beds were made of straw, and as you turn around, all that straw comes down and hits you in the face if you're in the bottom bunk. So the veterans always got the, the, the better. Uh, what time is it getting to be? Well, I can keep going here forever. Um, I can do other things if you want me to, but maybe I can answer some questions. Oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Can't turn around that far. Yeah, the Maple Grove is the Montague Bathing Beach area. Uh, we used to call that across from what was Bartos Marina. There's a little marina there today. That's Maple Grove. Is that, yeah. was that a last name of a family? I think it was just the kind of wood they had. Here. As I said, oh, Jewel. Oh, he, yeah, he was a lumberman. Uh, he bought out the uh, Ferry Dowling operation and moved some of the equipment to Maple Grove. Um, there's a question back here. I've got two in a row here. I don't know who will in the second. With the, uh, I have three questions. 
Sure. Um, how did these kids um, <laughs> no, he just learned by by doing it. I mean, as I say, some of these companies started out in Maine, New York, Pennsylvania, places in the east. And as they used up the log, the lumber there, the timber there, they they gave up, maybe sold out their holdings, and they moved west. So most of our yeah. loggers come from the east, and the, and the whole industry is moving west until it gets to Minnesota. And then you get the plains, you know, you got no trees out there. And then it jumps over to the west coast, to the big uh, uh, trees out there. In, in Oregon and, and, and California, the, the word lumberjack means a sissy. That's the fellows that cut down these little puny trees in Michigan. And They're timber, timber bosses, timber beers and so forth. We got to the big trees, you know. The one where you can go through, take your car through it. So, uh, they're a difficult there. And you had two more questions. Oh, you're happy. All right. Can yes. I tell you yes. A sweet story. A friend of mine grew up in Quebec. Mm -hmm. And she's probably about the nineteen thirties. Her family, her dad, um, had ten or eight or ten children. Mm -hmm. And he would go for several months to be a lumberjack in the Michigan woods. Yeah. And one year everybody said he, he was going to be back for Christmas. And he was gone for months. Anyway, he woke up Christmas morning and there he was. So. Showed up. Probably took a bath just then too, because the only one he took all year long. You know, these, these fellas, they, they would take off their outer duds when they went to bed at night because they were all wet. They'd hang it up over the booze and um, then they'd sleep in their, their underwear. See, red flannel, usually two piece. The others were too complicated, they had traps and such. So, uh, and, and, and so they, hardly, they never took a bath. I mean, there's no place to take a bath. So they take a bath once a year in the spring, and that usually did them until next spring. See? You never know what's going to happen. Uh, you're talking about the, the different nationalities. A lot of them are French Canadians, they're called pea supers. You couldn't understand them. What do you say? I don't know. Uh, you had the round heads, those were Scandinavians. They called that because they, they cut their hair, you know, put a bowl over their head, and they cut all the way around it, you know. Then you got the mix, those are the Irish one, you know. Uh, some of my ancestors was Irish. You couldn't tell that from there. And the Germans, and the, we call those Krauts, of course. And then you got people from all nationalities. It was said in a big lumber camp that they snored in 14 different languages. <laughs> I don't know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Other questions? Dan, the, the Ferry family kind of had it all. Yes. How does Dowling come into the picture? Well, see, the, the usual pattern uh, with these companies that have a, felt a fairly wealthy partner, in the case of the Ferries, the Ferries owned three quarters of the company, and Dowling was the local partner. He owned only a quarter, but it was a wealthy company, a big mill, so he made a good fortune out of it. So usually the money bags, um, they, they uh, control the business. They have half of it or two-thirds of it. And they're, they live in Chicago, they live in Milwaukee, or in even someplace. And they hire a local person, usually their foreman or the uh, a trusted worker, uh, to be their local partner. And so he contributes only his labor and his knowledge and wisdom. He has no money to begin with. So they did that all the time. Like Mears, for example, partnered with uh, Sprague or Sturdivant or one of his other friends in the neighborhood, and, and they did the actual work in, in, at the mill and in the logging camp, and Mears stayed in Chicago but toured his camps from time to time. So they're pretty much all operated that way. Now, Staples and Coal are a little different because you've got brothers and brothers-in-law in, in that operation, and they all were about equally poor when they started out, and, uh, but, but they gained through, they started small, small scale, and then they built it up to a profitable business. So it varies a little bit from company to company. But usually when you see a partnership, it's one wealthy dude, maybe two wealthy dudes, and some local guy like Craven, in the case of the uh, Heald, Avery, um, Murphy Company. Murphy was from Maine, Heald was from Maine. Craven was a local guy who ran the mill. So something, they don't even get their name in the, in the uh, byline, you know. Other questions? I won't stand up, I feel a little better. I can't see very well. Hey, put on my glasses. Watch the cord. Up. 
these glasses from old Doc Harrington. He used to live on Old Channel Trail. Well, where all those flowers is right near your house. Uh, what's your question? Um, I have to notice that on, on the logging marks, yep. the, the same company can have several different logging marks. Oh, in yes, we'll come. Oh, no, they would, that's over a span of time. These logging marks are in books in the, the state archive. And they're, they're old, moth eaten books. They wouldn't even let me copy with a copy machine. I had to photograph every one of them. So uh, every company, these companies often lasted 40, 50, 60 years. And the, so they'll, they'll deal with a particular logger for a couple, three years. And then he's logged off and they'll move on to another site. Wilcox, we have, there's over a page full of Wilcoxes. I mean, he's a big family for one thing. They had Mills and White Lake and uh, Muskegon. And then they apparently dealt with a lot of small scale farmers or loggers. So they had to have all those different marks for all their different sources of logs. Usually four or five, six. But also they traded them. So let's say you had a partner who left. He would sell out to a new guy who bought his partnership. So you may have to change the name of the company. Or maybe somebody was crooked and they drove him away and brought somebody else in to take his place. I mean, there's all kinds of shenanigans in this. Most of it was pretty straightforward, but uh, there were some dishonest. Well, you know the story about the log marks. Between here and the camps, there were always little bayous, and somebody, some of these logs would go astray, and uh, somebody would saw off both ends and uh, put another mark in their place. And uh, now we find those all the time. They're not always evidence of chicanery. It could be honest. It could be that at the mill site, the one end was kind of ragged and would be difficult to put through the carriage, so they would saw off the end to make it easier to manipulate. And so some of them are legitimate, just the way they had to do business. But a lot of them are evidence of, of thievery, called dehorning. See, these logs are marked with a hammer, but it's the same principle as you would put a, a, a brand on a cow. Uh, but they branded on the horns originally. But of course, that was too easy. Uh, somebody come along, cut off the horn, <laughs> and you wouldn't have any evidence it was my cow. So they started branding with a branding iron after that. It was the same principle. There's always some cunning, uh, chicanerous types. Question, yes, sir. Uh, you, they could, you could still find some of those log ends yes. along White Lake. Uh, oh yes, I the holding yard. I, this where I found by the park, they would float up and. Oh, Even a shorter time as 10 to 15 years ago. Oh, yeah, well, th when they were putting in the marina, they found a lot of them in there. Oh, I, I suspect there. they were, big pardon? I was there. Uh, when they were digging away at the... 1969. Yeah. I was with Pillinger. Oh, yeah, and Harry. He and Dick Webster and I basically built what became what's now what they planned. Uh-huh, sure. We dug out the... the skippers uh, underneath. We dug out the uh, haul out. Now, all those places, I, I live right... We found about 30. Oh, sure. I live right at the base of the Wilcox Mill, and I find log ends there even now. What I found was fascinating was some of the ends of this wire. Oh, yeah, they're gigantic. They cut them off for Stella. Oh, sure. And, and just about half an inch in, it was clear. Uh-huh. I mean, just... Yeah, I mean, they have to have a little furniture out of it. Sure, you bet. This one is from the Wilcox Mill. It has a Y sheet here, all the way around. So they got a mark all the way around it. Anything else I haven't told you about here? Oh, I forgot. I'm so proud of this. I just found it yesterday. This is a pipe. Oh. Yeah. I call it an attitude adjuster. Uh, normally, these would run 12 to 14 feet long. This is just a puny one. <laughs> It's only 10 feet long. These were used by uh, river drivers. They used a PV and or a pike. And um, uh, they're riding the logs down the river, you know, to make sure that they get to the destination. And they pull logs off from the banks. And, and this gives them some balance, too. If you, um, if you started to fall off the log, you might be able to help yourself by planting this in into the um, 
ground or keep yourself upright. Uh, it's called a pike. The peavy looks a lot like a cant hook. I got one, but uh, I was trying to put a new handle on it, and uh, I couldn't get through all that hardwood with my primitive tools, so that's for another day. But it's a lot like a cant hook, except it has a point at the end, so you can stick it into logs and move them around a little bit more easily. Put this away. They're heavy. All right, other questions, huh? What's my time limit? Oh yes, well, see, the question is, was the logging in White Cloud about the same? See, all along all of the rivers there are mills. So there were a couple mills at Hesperia. There, was, uh, there were mills at Nuego, the Muskegon. And so, not all the logs got all the way down the river. I mean, it is a long way. Plus, you've got that dam at Hesperia. So it wouldn't make much sense to send any logs down there from White Cloud. So they all have mills. And they took advantage of the local things in proximity to their, their mill, the pine logs. All right, questions? Oh, there's one there. Oh, no, that's not Larry. I'm sorry. Um, was it a very uh, risky thing? Was a lot of mortality? Or was it oh, yeah. They didn't keep records of those kinds of things. Um, for one thing, the company always refused to accept responsibility for this. Um, so what a typical lumber jack would do is he'd buy a hospital ticket. Uh, Steve and I wrote a book on the medical history of Muskegon County a couple of years ago, so we know about these things. You could buy a ticket to the Big Rapids Mercy Hospital. It was something like $10 a year, and that would give you total services for the whole rest of the year, not only for yourself, but for your family. So if you got some minor injury, say you cut off your foot, you could go there and they could take care of you for a while. Um, reminds me of a story about Ty the dog. Well, I'll tell you that in a minute. Um, you know, Tim, I any, how much more time do I have? Should I quit? There's a question here. Well, I'll, I'll get through with your question. So, your question, so, so you also, there was a group in, in Muskegon called uh, uh, leave, leave Out the Men, the uh, ladies order of the Maccabees, and they started a hospital fund, um, and a little hospital, so if you bought a ticket from them, you could get care at, at, at one of their facilities, which was very small scale. Or you could go, if you were deaf, you got, if you died, some uh, law, uh, lumberman would, would get uh, insurance policies. But of course, they didn't trust American insurance companies. If you're a Scandinavian, you go to the Scandinavian, uh, insurance company, because you didn't trust Americans. I mean, think of yourself in Afghanistan. Uh, would you trust the Afghani doctors and hospitals to take care of your snake bite? So you, you only trust your own people. And so the Scandinavians go to the Scandinavian, the Dutch go to the Dutch, and the Germans go to the Germans. And they all had insurance companies. And uh, they would pay out for a death, but uh, the company wouldn't pay out. They'd go to court and the company would almost always win because they had the money and the poor workers uh, uh, would all had, had nothing. So a lot of problems. These were dangerous jobs. You could get yourself cut. You could get yourself killed. You could uh, injure yourself. Of course, they're out in the woods. They get flu and, and uh, viruses and colds and all kinds of stuff like that. All right, other questions. Another one back here. Yes. Groups. Two, two items for um, the historical interest Marks, marks, yes. are created into law in Michigan in 1845, and Michigan is only eight years old. Sure. Well, <coughs> and then sure. navigability was defined uh, early in Michigan law as a stream deep enough to float a 12-inch sure. pine log. In other words, if I've got <coughs> something running through my land, I own both. Mm -hmm. Normally, think that I can block it off but, from that, the rest of the world, and the answer is no, I can't. Because it's a navigable stream because it's able to float that dimension of the law. Mm -hmm. That means the whole world can pass through my land, and I cannot sure. block Okay, did you all hear that? Yeah. Actually, there were several um, log, mark, 
laws on the books. I have a, a set of law books from 1830s through the 1900s over at my office if you ever want to get into those old laws. They're really interesting. Um, any other questions? Oh, another question back here. Is that Joe? I can't see good. Put my glasses away. <coughs> Uh -huh. Well, it's a, it's a sliding scale. I mean, you have in a camp uh, young boys who were chore boys, they'd probably get 50 cents a day or plus all they could eat. And then you have an ordinary log uh, lumberjack. They'd probably make around $30 a month. But of course, if they went to the company store and bought something, that comes off their pay. And it varies too. It goes with the uh, economy. Uh, it, the economy was bursting through the Civil War because you didn't have enough workers. Uh, they all went off, to, many of them went off to the war, so you needed workers. So the wages were high then. And uh, then they started uh, going down right after the war, and they reached a bottom in the 1870s, the Big Depression. I mean, they, they, things always worked that way, and they started back up again. So they vary with the, the economy. Now, uh, the uh, setter, the, the foreman, he's going to probably make $80 a month. The blacksmith, probably 100 The cook, maybe the same amount. Uh, the cooks were valuable. Uh, I had this little joke I used to tell. Um, the logging camp cook, he can dance you a jig, but he can't boil swill for a homesteader's pay. And I told that little joke, I thought it was a joke, uh, up in Traverse City one time, many years ago. And right after the the session, these two old gals came up to me. They were no older than I am today, but they looked old to me. So they said, took offense at me because their mother had been a bunking camp cook and I had reviled her. So, but the, the camps, actually, most of the cooks were excellent. You couldn't keep a, a group of men in camp if you didn't have a good cook. And that was just the way it was. Oh, do I, do I have another minute? You can take another uh, one, one more story. Well. This was when I was still working for Paul Bunyan, and we was sharing our camp with a bunch of Hoosiers. Now, a Hoosier isn't necessarily somebody from Indiana. These particular Hoosiers were from Illinois. A Hoosier is a word for an incompetent, a dunghead. I put a, a bunch of longer slang in the back of your manuals there, you'll find it there. Well, they was out hunting. But they was Hoosiers, and they t took a shot at this big buck, he was a 12-pointer, and they only nicked him. And of course, they couldn't track him for love or money. So we had in the camp uh, a dog, he belonged to the foreman, his name was Ty. And we got old Ty on the trail of, the, of that buck and chased him around and chased him around. But that old buck, was he was wounded, but he was still fast. He was a lot bigger than Ty, so Ty kept tracing him around. And, I was out there cutting wood. I had a big, big um, log and I had kindling wood on top and I'd bring my axe down on top and he made the mistake of come running through there just as I was coming down with that axe and I couldn't help it. But I sliced him right down the middle from head to toe. Well, I felt pretty bad about that, you know, because it wasn't my dog and it was an accident. It was partly his fault. He should have known better. So I <coughs> thought, well, I don't know to tell the foreman about this, probably fire me. Well, I looked down there, and I sliced him in half, all right, but his heart was still beating real strong. And when I went down to look at him, he licked me with half a tongue, and he was wagging half a tail. So I figured he was doing okay. So I remember what my mother had did when I was a kid. She had this special medicine made up of turpentine and sassafras bark and pine nodules and all kind of crap like that. And she put it on my finger, I cut my finger off and she put it on there and put it up in burlap. And a couple, three weeks later, it was feeling pretty good. I could scratch my butt pretty well with it. And so it worked. So I figured if that would work for my finger, it might work on old tie. So I stuck them back together. I wasn't wearing my glasses though. So I stuck them together, kind of upside down. So he had one side with two legs going down and the other side had two legs going up. And face was going this way and his tail was going the other way. And so I wrapped him up real heavy in this burlap bag and I took him over to my friend, Doc Demos. Well, Demos, he hadn't 
got much learning then. He was, hadn't gone to school, but he knew a lot of homemade remedies. And he had this salve that he put on there. He, uh, uh, what, he didn't know quite what to do with it, but he humored me. So he put this salve all over and kind of stitched it together a little bit here and there. And Lordy knows, Ty lived. He was doing right well, and after a couple of months, he learned to run on those two legs, and he was doing pretty good. And uh, that all worked real well until the next winter, and then along came these two Hoosiers again. I think they learned their lesson. But uh, they come out, and they shot again at another buck and wounded him again, because they weren't any smarter than they were before, better shots, and so we put old Ty on them. Well, Ty was not as fast as he used to be, so he was still following that buck around, and they'd come around the camp every couple hours or so. Now, after two hours, Ty was getting kind of tired. So I picked him up, turned him over, and started running again, and he was just as fast as he was before. And that old buck was tiring, but a couple hours later, buck came by and fagged out a little bit, turned him over, and started him running again. 18 hours later, he finally caught up with that buck, and finally those two Hoosiers took a shot at his head from two feet away and killed him. Here's my story. Oh, all right. You don't believe me. All right. So, anything else? Got to quit. You got to do your celebration? Yeah. Just okay. I think we need to give him a big round of applause. give you some announcements that she asked if she could give while the rest of our board kind of goes back and gets our refreshments situated. So you are all invited to stay for birthday cake and lunch and sharing of, I'm not done yet. You called me up. I was, you were already here. Sharing of memories and we would like to know if you, how many of you may have been a charter member? Anybody? Big Darwin started it. Are there any former charter members here? A charter member. Are you? Charter Is member. Are you a I charter think. member, Ruth? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I joined later. But you oh, go a long okay. way. Yeah. Right. Have any of you been members for 30 years or more? Oh, yeah. This mother. Just one. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. And so I'm going to turn it now over to Margo. And in just about five minutes, please come back and join us for refreshments. Yeah, I'm the cover up so they can get ready for you. Um, there's a bunch of wonderful programs coming up, in, really mostly in the next month, and one of them is Wednesday night next week. There is uh, a series of books put out by Arcadia Publishing about different uh, cities in the United States, and the one about Muskegon has just come out, and the two authors are going to be here at Montague City Hall down below the library, sponsored by the Friends of the Montague Library, and they're gonna have books for sale at a couple dollars off a piece, and they'll have a, a, a video or a slideshow to show you and talk about how they did their research. Much of it at Hackley Library, but other places as well. So that should be a pretty interesting historical presentation next Wednesday night at seven. That's the 26th. And um, then I have a poster here for the yearly cemetery tour down in Muskegon that takes place on the um, 13th Saturday and the 14th Sunday, 5 to 8 on Saturday. So if you want a spooky afternight tour of the cemetery, you can have it. Or Sunday afternoon, 2 to 4, if you don't want the spookiness. And um, there are about, I don't know, 12, 15 stops with characters dressed up in period telling you about their lives, including the man with the branded hand and uh, Charles Hackley and many others. So, um, you know, come on down the 13th or 14th uh, to Evergreen Cemetery, okay? Um, then, um, this is between Whitehall and Montague. It's called One Book, One Community. The friends of both libraries are working together to sponsor a community read. And the book is the 
$500 house in Detroit. And you can get it at the Book Nook, or if you go to the Montague Library, they have some that you can borrow and take home that are provided by the Maddle system. And the White Hall and Montague Friends Groups are having a number of presentations. One of them is going to include the Ripley House. Uh, so uh, we'll have our guests from tonight, our awardees, talking about how they approached their remodeling project and some of the adventures they had. And there will be four other local remodelers. I think it's four other. I'm not quite sure of the list yet. And this is going to be on Tuesday, the 16th of October, also in Montague City Hall Council Chambers. And uh, based on the story in this book, our local people are going to talk about how rebuilding houses also rebuilds community. And it should be a real interesting set of presentations. Um, Semi-historical, because they're taking historical buildings and trying to preserve them um, and make them into something new at the same time. Um, this One Book, One Community will also include another panel discussion that will be on the other side of the river at Lebanon Lutheran um, on the 23rd of October. And then a book discussion at the Book Nook, once you've read the book, the first Wednesday in November. And then finally, we're going to close out with a potluck at Lebanon Lutheran with the author attending both the potluck and giving a talk. And that'll be on the night of Veterans Day, the 11th, Sunday night. Um, so put that on your list as a real good thing to read. And uh, finally, while we're talking about books, I would like to mention Dan Yates has not just his uh, logging the white new publication that you could be the first person to buy tonight, evidently, um, but some of his others, other books. And we didn't put them where the cake and ice cream are because we thought sticky fingers, not a good idea. But if you want to buy them, you can look at them on your way to the cake and ice cream. You can come on back, I'll stay there. Dan is willing to sign them for you, but he'll probably be where the cake and ice cream is. Uh, but all of his books, well, not most of his books. Steve will sign too. Yes, and Steve will sign it as well. So that's what you call this lobby between here and the social hall. The what? Narthax. Oh, there's a historical word, Narthax. In the Narthax is where you can look at those books before you go for the cake and ice cream. And I think that's all the announcements, so, um, and it looks like they're ready for you. Yep.